So um, for the next uh, half hour, and I'll leave some time for questions, I'm going to just give you a brief history of the Loft Theatre. Um, it's a theatre that I became part of in 1970, so I've been there a, an incredibly long period of time, uh, and I'm currently the artistic director there, and I both uh, direct and uh, act too just finished in my 58th play, I think it is. Um, and I'm also part of the, the trustee board. So I'm quite deeply involved in, in the, uh, the past, current and future loft. So just a little bit about how it all began. And starting at the beginning, it began in the 1920s, actually on Friday, the 5th of May, 1922 when two reverends, the Reverend William and Reverend Wilner Constable, a married couple, they met with 18 like-minded people in their home in Woodcut Road in Warwick. And um, Mrs. Wilner Constable was a minister of the Unitarian Church in Warwick and was very fond of literature. She's fond of, uh, of including Shakespeare and Shaw in her services. As she was uh, quoted as saying, inspiration doesn't cease with the final chapter of Revelation. So she was uh, very keen on uh, playwrights and including them in her role there. So they met at the, uh, the home on that night to explore the possibility of founding um, a drama club. And the decision was made to proceed that evening. They created some uh, a constitution and they decided to call the society the Warwick and Leamington Dramatic Study Club, which later due to its location being principally anchored in Leamington became the Leamington and Warwick Dramatic Study Club. The president was somebody called Edwin Hill and the two reverends became secretary and the director of plays and the committee included uh, Mary Dormer Harris, of course, a famous literary um, figure within the town. So there was quite a cultural community developing in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and so the society decided to meet uh, uh, weekly in the summer and in the winter fortnightly, and they tried not to clash with any of the other arts organizations so that they could actually get the maximum attendance. Um, they always intended to read plays, but also to perform. So performance was always in their minds right from the beginning. So they elected all their officers and they started reading plays principally, but then their first performance was the Silver Box by John Galsworthy, which they performed uh, to a privately invited audience, one performance only, in the Spencer Street Congregational School Hall, um, now known as the United Reformed Church and uh, subject to some development in Leamington really soon. Uh, so on the 24th of March, 1923, they held this first performance. And then it was actually another two years before they performed in 1924, um, Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. Um, and the reason they could do that, because they had to keep an eye on finances, obviously, and royalty payments can be very crippling to early um, theatre groups. Um, but George Bernard Shaw at the time was his own agent. And so the royalties were very well priced and they were, he was quite a favourite really for them to perform. Um, there, they were driven, of course, by these watching the costs. Um, and at the end of their, their year, they had 47 members altogether and five shillings and tuppence in the bank. And once they had actually covered most of their costs in staging plays, they were, they were well known for giving the rest away, any profits away to charitable causes. And they used to advertise that when they advertised the play. So we have some posters in our archive um, where they, in 1923, they donated some money to the Miners Relief Fund. Um, so they made lots of charitable donations once they covered their costs. They didn't have a home, so they performed all over the place. Uh, Leamington College for Boys, the Leamington Town Hall, the Jefferson Gardens Pavilion, 
the Blue Cafe in Bath Street. Um, and uh, it, it really all of these places, frequent, they were frequented by them um, and they made several productions. Uh, certainly I know at Leamington College for Boys where they had a particularly close relationship there. So in the 1930s, then after their formation, they found their first premises. They began looking around in the 1930s. And in 1932, they found a barn. On the parade, um, there was a furniture shop that had quite a smart showroom uh, called Andrews Furniture Makers. And at the back of Andrews, uh, back of the parade, runs Bedford Street, as you will know. And in Bedford Street, there was a barn that Andrews used for repairing and restoring and creating furniture. Um, and upstairs, there was a hayloft. And this was the space that um, the Leamington and Warwick Dramatic Study Club rented for a year for 50 pounds. And because they were in the hayloft, the word loft uh, started to be used as a nickname and then you know really just stuck. Um, so the first production in the barn or the loft as it was known was The Servant of Two Masters by Carolo Goldini and they stayed at uh, this site in Bedford Street for nine years. The building was in a dreadful state. Um, it was uh, really difficult to repair and to keep going, terribly cold. Um, and in 1941, um, the members were given notice of the demolition of the building. So their last production there was a play called The Lady from Albuquerque, and uh, they were homeless and on the move again. So for the next two years, 1942 and 1943, they formed again in the venues that I'd mentioned to you, the church halls, the town hall, etc. And then in 1943, um, the members found the old Colonnade Theatre, originally the Victoria Grand Pavilion, built in 1870, was available uh, for sale. It had been used for a number of things over the years as a riding school, as a circus, with elephants uh, as a cinema, picture house, uh, a retail store, a skating rink, and it had been requisitioned by the war office for a as a camouflage department um, during the war. So it had had lots of incarnations, but it was now empty and it was for sale for £4,000. And this was £4,000 that they didn't have. So they had to start doing lots of fundraising and uh, they managed to raise the money and they moved in and a refurbishment began. The, the room that they used as their auditorium was not raked, it was flat. Um, they acquired some secondhand seats from the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. Um, the membership of the theatre turned their hands to much of the work and their first production was a play by George Bernard Shaw um, was the first production at what they called then the Colonnade Theatre uh, and it was called Fanny's First Play, so probably an apt title for the first play in that, in that site. And so the refurbishment began as well um, in the 1940s, so they started first of all to rake the auditorium, which means to, to have um, obviously better viewing, of course, with the, the seats being raised at the back and then graduating down to the front row. Um, and they did lots of uh, alterations and lots of improvements. Um, and this um, refurbishment went on across the productions and it was to be the home for the loft for the next 13 years. But then in 1958, uh, a disaster struck. The, the the company was rehearsing their Christmas production of uh, Alice in Wonderland, which was in rehearsal, and there was a fire. A fire that didn't destroy the whole place, but did a lot of damage to the stage and also to the dressing room area. Front of house was not so badly damaged, but we were in trouble. And um, again, the really wonderful relationships that people had with the loft 
is that they welcomed us at the Leamington Boys College with open arms and said, please do come um, and, and perform your play at the school. So um, they went to perform that production there. And then obviously it was gonna take some time to refurbish the theater after the fire. And so they were back to being homeless again and uh, back to the town hall, uh, the Jefferson Gardens uh, Pavilion and other um, venues. And then after 14 months of recovery and refurbishment at the theater, it reopened and performances continued for the next five years. And then uh, on the 4th of November, 1964, a much, much more serious fire destroyed the entire theater. There's lots of photographs of the theater ablaze. And Madeline Gorrell, um, who died last year, who was the wardrobe mistress when I first became part of the loft, she was shopping in town and saw the fire engines on the bridge um, by the river and said, not again. Um, and this fire was um, severe and uh, the whole theater was destroyed. This was shocking and devastating and upsetting, but actually what came out of it, I think, was, was so fortunate for the loft because we had the chance then to rebuild a theater from scratch and to have it designed, architect designed and designed specifically as a theater. Because as you may know, the non-professional theater in the UK is a vast group of theaters. And actually they mostly have acquired buildings that they've adapted and tried to make into a theater. So I think the loft was so fortunate to be able to have um, despite the devastating nature of the change, I have a custom built theatre that had everything a theatre wanted, not the auditorium to be custom designed. And Stanley Sellers, who was the architect who designed it, actually designed the proscenium arch the stage and the wings to the dimensions of the then main house at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. So this is why we have such, for those of you who have visited the loft, such a beautiful auditorium acoustically very advantageous, very actor friendly, very audience friendly. You can see from every seat, very deep wings, which is a, a treat really as a non-professional theater, a very deep stage and a wide proscenium arch. We also had the chance to build a green room, to build dressing rooms with ensuite facilities, a paint shop, a workshop, prop stores, a wardrobe, coffee lounge, a very large bar, um, very comfortable bar and quite a large space and all next to the river. So it, it was actually um, a labor of love to get this building built. It was done a bit on the cheap. Uh, none of the walls internally were plastered. Uh, it had a flat roof, which has been uh, tricky to say the least and still gives us a lot of problems. Um, but we got it built. We didn't build everything that we'd wanted to because the money ran out. Uh, there was going to be a fly tower. We still have the architect's drawings in the archive, but it never materialized. Um, places like the loft and there are others like us, we have no funding. We live on our wits. We live on the enterprise that we have to stage plays and to, to drive our revenue through the box office. And so um, this theater, emerged like the phoenix and um, the first production um, was in September 1968. This wasn't a huge fanfare production because it takes quite a bit of time to get used to a, a new building, to get used to how it works, um, to get the rhythm of your company working well within it, uh, getting used to it. And so um, we didn't have a gala performance for a, several months. We just opened with Private Lives by Noel Coward. And he wrote a letter to us to congratulate us on the opening and the opening of the building as well. And we still have that letter. When I first became part of the theater, it used to sit in a frame proudly in the bar, but in order to not let the daylight get at it, it's now kept very safely in the archives instead. But he sent a good luck note. Um, it was quite a polite note, actually, because Noel Coward 
when asked if he was to give advice to uh, amateur theatre performers, he just said, yes, learn your lines and don't bump into the furniture, was one of his famous quotes. So um, I think this was just slightly more encouraging. Um, we started art exhibitions on all of the wall space. Uh, that has continued throughout the history of the theatre. And then we had an official opening and a gala night on the uh, 3rd of May, uh, 1969. And this was um, the, the British amateur premiere of The Lion in Winter by James Goldman. A black tie event, an invited audience, champagne reception, and a full house, of course, um, but a wonderful, wonderful celebration after all the gloom and all the worry um, that um, previously we'd had. Um, at the time that I joined uh, in 1970, um, the role that I have as artistic director was then known as the director of productions. And there was a man called Robert Collingridge, Bob Collingridge, who was in that role when I joined. I think he was one of the instrumental people in setting the tone for the loft of working highly towards professional standards. And, and a talk that I often give is, I, I term, title it, The Importance of Being Earnest, because he was, he was serious about what he did, but wanted everybody to enjoy it. But he, absolutely, we had to be the best version of ourselves. We had to do everything to the best possible standard. And he always said to me, you know, you can try and talk your way to happiness, Sue, or you can show people. And so it, it began that we had huge links with the professional theatre, particularly our close neighbours at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, and young directors who were joining them, young costume designers who were joining them. He invited them to come over and work with us, and they did. And I think those links actually showed people what the standards were like, and it has continued and, and does continue to this day. How fortunate have we been? We've often had costumes donated to us from them, whole sets of costumes sometimes. Um, in the next production that we have coming up of Howard Brenton's version of Anne Boleyn, there are two massive doors um, that we have um, on the stage and they were both donated to us by the RSC and still going strong. Um, our patron is Andrew Davis, the BAFTA award winning um, writer who lives still in Kenilworth and who of course has become world famous I guess for all the adaptations particularly of classic novelists such as uh, Jane Austen on television. So Andrew is, is our patron. And we still have these um, large links with the RSC and with many in the, um, the profession. Many, many people, I would say the majority of people at the Loft have been involved in the professional theatre or still are. And so that kind of standard is something we've always worked towards to actually present things in the best um, possible way. We also took on quite a lot of um, brave work, I think, across our history. Bob Collingridge was very keen on grabbing the, the amateur premieres of plays as soon as they were released from West End production. And we, we were one of the first amateur theatres to stage Pinter. Um, there are many headlines in the archives that says things like gritty play at the loft, inspiring and daring, brave loft stages, world amateur premiere of etc. So uh, it's, it's a spirit that I think has been a, a theme throughout the work that we've portrayed. We um, refurbished the front of house in uh, 2016. Um, the auditorium seats were in a really bad state and needed to be completely refurbished. So a, a specialist company came in, took every seat out, uh, numbered every seat to make sure it went back in exactly the same way because they weren't always exactly the same dimensions. Uh, completely refurbished, they were cut their cast iron um, seats from old cinema theatre use and they've all been beautifully refurbished. Um, brand new dimmable house lights um, and the, the auditorium um, was redecorated and we've got brand new lighting, we've got new mechanised pulley systems on our lights as well. So we've spent a lot of money um, on the theatre refurbishing it and I think it's now a very comfortable experience for people. Um, although that the, 
the theatre has had these two devastating fires, I think that the desire to perform has been undimmed really. Um, and that spirit carried us through to perform when we were, re, re, when we were building the current theatre. We stayed for quite a long time in the Urquhart Hall in Leamington, which was our home at the time. So we're so grateful for those who supported us during this time and for the money that was raised. At the time, George Farmer, Sir George Farmer from Rover Cars was our chairman, and he certainly raised a huge amount of money through the business community. Um, and we were fortunate indeed in actually being able to create those funds. And without financial support or grants in other directions, it was absolutely critical. So we are poised now in 2021, uh, having survived a pandemic um, where we put on seven audio productions online to keep connection with our audience. We made three attempts to reopen that were all thwarted uh, by going into a, a tier of closed down and then locked down nationally. Um, we got very close. We got within a week of opening one production and had to shut it. Um, but we have now opened. We reopened in July. Uh, we are doing a production as we normally do, one play every month. Next year is our centenary, which I think is quite something. The only independent live theatre, privately owned building in Leamington, is celebrating a hundred years of uh, unbroken uh, performance um, in some way or other. Uh, a world war and two fires never stopped the loft. It was only the pandemic that essentially ended up closing our doors. But we've got 10 productions planned for next year and lots of events too. Um, and we've been looking at some statistics because it's it's quite good fun to have a look at this when you're getting to uh, be a hundred years old as to some of the things that you've done. Um, so we have actually staged uh, 875 productions in that hundred years. Um, 84 were in Bedford Street, 146 were in the original colonnade building 28 were in the Urquhart Hall where we were rebuilding the current uh, theatre uh, and 473 have been performed since the theatre opened, reopened in 1968. 75 in our studio theatre and 62 uh, elsewhere in other venues and then seven audio productions during lockdown. So uh, 875 productions is a lot of work, a lot of people, a lot of love and commitment, and uh, a lot of, I hope, happy audiences who enjoy spending time with us. So uh, if you haven't been, I do hope that you might uh, come and see us. The colonnade entrance down towards the theater, which has been a building site for several years now, is emerging as the beautiful butterfly we knew it would. It's looking absolutely glorious. Um, the tiling on the floor and the wonderful lighting um, has really is really making it and some of the boards that are currently up there whilst they've been tiling the floor will be down very soon and I know that their restaurant is is aimed to be uh, opening towards the end of the year so um, I do hope that you will come and see us at some point you will be assured a really warm welcome and um, I can take any questions that you have. Thank you, Sue. That was excellent. And it's wonderful that you're going to be surrounded these now by the creative portrait, aren't you, with all what they're going to do at the back of the old church and the buildings around there? Well, it certainly will look a lot smarter, yes. Um, Not so yeah. nice. And the fact that the old uh, pre-use of the original building was the camouflage unit with all those artists and everything who came down to run the camouflage unit all 250 and set design and everything. So you're carrying on the tradition quite well. Could everybody unmute themselves, please, if you want to ask questions? So I muted you all. But that was excellent. Thank you very much for doing it and taking part. It's a pleasure. I can see a pussy cat there. Oh, there's always a cat. Oh, what did the cat? What did the cat think? He looks a bit inscrutable. I'm not sure. I think he was a bit bored actually. He said I wasn't. I wasn't totally particularly engaged by that. Nothing to eat. <laughs> 
Nobody's unmuted themselves. No, they have, they've, I've stunned them into silence. Hi, Sue. So, good morning. Hi, hello, Mark. Good morning. <laughs> um, just yeah, a couple of things actually, minor questions really, but just things that struck me as you were going through. You mentioned that there were plans for a fly tower. Yes. Never built. What is a fly tower? Oh, I'm so sorry. It's so that you can fly scenery up into it, away from the stage. You know, sometimes when people remove parts of the set and it flies out of sight, it goes up into a fly tower, which is what it's called, and. Um, so you need a lot of height above your stage to be able to do that. And we've got quite a bit of depth, but not, not enough to do that. So the fly tower that was planned. Uh, so would that have required sort of a big hole in the roof and an extra? Roof? <laughs> yes, you needed to go up a bit. Yes, that's for sure. And, and all then, of the systems and then the other, My other too. question, and then I'll let mm. someone else ask, but you, you mentioned um, Servant of Two Masters as being yes. one of the sort of early landmark productions. Mm. If I am correct, um, one man, two governors is... Yes, that's right. It became that, yes. That. Have you ever done a production of that or have you ever considered it? Uh, we haven't done a production of it. I mean, some of our sister theatres around us certainly have, but uh, no, we, we haven't. Not yet. But it is, you're quite right. It was the original work from which one man, two governors emerged. Yeah. I mean, actually, the repertoire of plays for the loft if you go onto our theatre website and just idly go through um, browsing through the, what we've performed it, it reads like a potted history of the last hundred years of, of drama and it's it's almost like a true chronicle of our times when hi sue can i just hi, ask Sarah. hi um so what sort of plans have you got for your centenary next year if you've got anything up your sleeve uh, well, we're, we're staging 10 productions altogether. Um, we do a production every month anyway. Um, uh, we've got, um, we've just finished a production that, that I was in, um, and which Mark came to see actually. Very and good, then... I should add. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, and then we're doing Anne Boleyn in, the, in November and we're doing Sondheim's Company, uh, the musical in December. And then next year we've got 10 productions which are in the main house and also in our studio theatre. We are writing a book about the history of The Loft, which is currently uh, starting to be edited. Um, also, we are going to work with Mark in developing um, a, a film about The Loft as well. Uh, so he and I have met to start thinking about scoping that out, which won't be necessarily a copy of the history because we're getting a book which will which will cover that but we are going to present that we have um one or two professional companies who are coming in to do one night performances special performances for us we have um the i mean it's difficult because for us he's very famous to if you love theater he's very famous but michael billington who's been the drama critic of the guardian for for decades is, is actually originally from leamington uh, in fact, he's actually walked the walk, trod the boards, as he put it, at the loft himself. Um, and then he lived in, in Coventry. I, I met his mother, actually, was a member of the loft when I first joined. And he's coming to, to do a talk with a, a famous actor who will everybody will know, um, who's going to come uh, spend time with us as well. Um, we've got a party, a huge party. And we've got a wonderful... Um, jazz band who are going to be playing a music from every decade of our history that night um i don't know if you've heard of them but but you need to know who they are actually because down for the count their band leader lives in warwick and it is an international um uh, swing band and jazz band um, they play at ronnie scott's in london they are currently supporting the royal philharmonic orchestra uh, and they actually play at the Paris Jazz Festival and they are in their world very famous indeed. And Mike Paul Smith, who's the band leader, he and his wife, uh, Eleanor, who's a professional actress who uh, was cast in a play at the loft um, just before we went into lockdown. And sadly, that play never happened, um, but they became friends of ours and um, he's going to come and play at our party, which 
is pretty special, frankly. Uh, he, he is also going to do an independent concert for us as well later in 2022 because uh, it, it was a complete sellout with a waiting list last time. So if you happen to like jazz, if you happen to like uh, swing bands, um, that's the group for you. So um, we're going to have um, an open day at the theatre too, uh, exhibitions about all our history. We're pulling loads of stuff out of the archive to do that. So uh, it's still being, still stuff being added all the time, but it's going to be a busy year. <laughs>